Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. I'm Richard Spivey, Associate Minister at Convent Avenue Baptist Church, where Reverend Dr. Jesse T. Williams, Jr. is Senior Pastor. I am so pleased to bring this message to you today, and I pray it will not only enlighten your faith, but also encourage you to hold fast to that which is our hope in these days when believers are falling away, for hope is always more powerful than fear. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we come before you, O Lord, and drink in this moment of peace that we may carry something of your hope, love, and joy in our hearts this day. Lord, grant us tenacious, winsome courage as we go through our days and when we are tempted to give up, help us to keep going on. Grant us a cheerful spirit when things don't go our way. We desire a deeper and more meaningful relationship with you, O Lord. Present yourself to us during this hour and amaze us with your word of truth. We offer this prayer in the mighty name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, Savior, and soon coming King. Amen. Well, our text for today can be found in Romans chapter 6, and I'll be reading the entire chapter, which is verses 1 through 23, out of the New International Version. Now, verses 1 through 14 are subtitled, Dead to Sin, Alive to God, and it reads, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death, like th in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrec resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. That's verses 1 through 14 of Romans chapter 6. And now verses 15 through 23 is subtitled, Slaves to Righteousness. What then shall we, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't offer... Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are a slave to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be sins to, uh, slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. 
You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using, using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations, just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this lesson, I'd like to first introduce you to some background we should consider. During Paul's tenure as apostle to the Gentiles, Roman society was inundated with the various Stoic and Epicurean philosophies like from the likes of Epictetus, Philodemus, Aristotle, Seneca, Cicero, and Plato. The Stoics cared about virtuous behavior and living according to nature, while the Epicureans were all about avoiding pain and seeking natural and necessary pleasures. Nonetheless, no matter how virtuous or pleasurable we try to live, there remains the issue of inherited sin. And although there was a Roman church, probably founded by a Jewish congregation that was kicked, uh, uh, evicted from Rome, the Jews were often influenced by the surrounding schools of thought. Thus, Paul's preaching was to keep their Christian faith intact. We must also consider that during this time, not all Jews believed in the resurrection of the body, and so one of the main reasons for Paul's discussion was to er er eradicate this false ideology. And once the evidence of the Savior's raising from the dead was proven evident by over 500 people of various cultures, nations, and languages, Paul had to make it perfectly clear for the church to understand the mystery of the gospel. But Paul's statement in chapter 5, verses 20 and 21 is explained more clearly in chapter 6, and we will cover that in this lesson so no one will be confused. Biblical scholar Douglas J. Moo writes, there was also the Jewish tendency to think that the covenant made them secure from all threat of, threat of judgment and has parallels in the Christian church. The genuine Christian does have security. That is, if we truly come to know Christ, we can absolutely be certain that we will appear with him in glory. But a belief in eternal security, as we sometimes call it, is often abused. Some people may think they are secure when they are not, because they have never truly come to the faith. They have walked up the aisle, raised their hand at an invitation, or been baptized, but they have never truly submitted to Christ as Lord. Such people are not secure in Christ, and we need to help them understand that real conversion is a challenge each professed believer and each professed believer has to make sure that his or her profession matches spiritual reality. One other fact is that so many people have received salvation but have not been delivered from the things that are sinful. Those of us who understand the scripture are, ob are obligated to define and refine the meaning of such verses. So again, chapter 6 is broken down into two sections. 
dead to sin, alive to God in verses 1 through 14, and slaves to righteousness in verses 15 through 23. In chapter 6, verse, verses 1 through 14, is Paul's continued dialogue, which extends from the last paragraphs in chapter 5, wherein he defies and, uh, defines inherited sin and death through Adam, and thus inherited an eternal life through the second Adam, Christ Jesus. He explains that although in Christ we are freed from the stain of sin by the shedding of his blood, and the sharing in his death, but also that the grace of God must never, I repeat, must never be an excuse for sin sinful living. If we have died to sin, we are assuredly freed from sin, but some might think it possible to give God an opportunity to increase the glory of his grace by sinning more and more. But this is a distortion of the truth, for we can give God nothing but our love and devotion to increase his grace. Psalm 116, 12 through 13 says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation, and call upon the name of the Lord. Furthermore, when we receive Jesus, we are professing a change or alteration in our hearts and thus a newness of life. It's a spiritual commitment to the death of Christ that the flesh, through our bad habits and desires, struggles to defeat the victorious urging of the Holy Spirit. Once we are baptized in Christ, we have committed ourselves to evicting sin from living in us as God's grace removes all condemnation. Read Romans 8.1. Theologian Joseph A. Fitzmaier contributes that Paul's statement in 521 may be controversial and introduce a mistaken conclusion that could be drawn when he said, just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This statement can be misconstrued to mean we should sin more, but Paul clarifies the oxymoronic notion that we should remain in sin so God's grace will abound even more. With the question, what shall we say then? Or, can sin glorify God's grace? To make it evident that we should not look for God's grace to be glorified more through continued or increased sinful living. Our unity in the death of Christ washes away all of what we inherited from Adam's fall in the garden. Let's look at it this way. Adam was created a son of God and thus likened to God in his image. But after his disobedience, everyone born of Adam becomes children of Adam and not children of God. From that point up until, up until this present day, Sin has waxed more and more, for the waywardness of our progenitor is passed down through the generational human bloodline, and thus it took the divine, holy, and pure blood of Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, to be shed for the cleansing of our degenerate being. One might contend that the laws of Moses or Noah's deluge had cleansed the human bloodline, but no one can live out the complete God-given law of the tablets, and the flood only rid the earth of the beastly half-human, half-angelic beings that roamed the planet after angels mated with the daughters of men and gave birth to the Nephilim in Genesis 6. Still, the human bloodline is tainted and in need of redemption. And since we cannot save ourselves, 
plus the fact that there are some who call themselves good people, I have tagged this lesson after the Lord's statement in Matthew nineteen seventeen. No one is good but the Father. Paul's oratory in Romans exemplifies the need of a Savior, and if we receive Jesus as such, we have become his in death and his in the resurrection. Then we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin, from sin. that's verse 6 of this of our text for the day and this nullifies any notion that the, that of there being any other way to heaven and eternal life with God the father for Jesus is the entrance gate and that dying without receiving Jesus will not take away our past sins because dying without accepting Jesus leaves our sin in intact and we're still held accountable for whatever, for whatever we are in life. We will be the same in death. Likewise, it suggests that, and Christians agree, when the Lord returns in glory, the redeemed will be raised to new life and enjoy the blessings of a glorified body. Now, the precise nature of a glorified body is a mystery, but scripture provides enough revelation for readers to imagine several of its features, such as the appearance of Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration in Mark 9, 2 through 8. Let's look at the word glory. The Hebrew word for glory uh, originally meant weighty, heavy, important. From there, it moved to the idea of an influential, rich, or prominent person. In ancient cultures, the wealthy and the powerful were marked by the finery of their dress and their jewels. Hence, a person's glory meant the ostentatious signs of wealth and power. The word glory also suggests beauty, since fine clothes and jewels were items of physical prosperity. However, the spiritual aspect of glory in Christ means every aspect of wealth beyond human imagination. You can read 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 58, and also consider these lyrics. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands, of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. Henceforth, Romans 6, 8-11 says, If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Pardon me. Some may ask about those who Jesus raised from the dead prior to his death and resurrection. So let us not mistake Lazarus being raised from the dead as his final death. Read John 11, 38 through 44. For he did die again because Jesus Christ had not yet opened the door to, uh, to eternal life by his resurrection. By the stories of Lazarus being called back to life in John 
the raising of the dead of Jairus's daughter, and the account of the widow of Nain's dead son being raised by Jesus in Luke 7, 11 through 17, the Bible delivers a powerful message to the world that Christ Jesus has power over death and those who believe in him receive resurrection life. Could Paul have had these stories in mind when he preached to the Romans? Now, I can't say who this is for, but the Holy Spirit is urging me to say that those of you with questions about predestination need to know that Paul never preached it. <coughs> Pardon me. In fact, he taught that God will render unto every man according to his deeds. For there is no respect of persons with God. Romans 2, verses 6 through 11. Biblical scholar Ellen R. Taylor contributes, we call pre uh, predestination God's eternal decree by which he determines within himself what he will to become of each man. With predestination, eternal life is foreordained for some and eternal damnation for others. Therefore, as any man has been created to, to one or the other of these ends, we speak of him as predestined to life or to death. And that is what John Calvin, Martin Luther of the Reformation period's successor and founder of the Presbyterian Church, uh, set the fundamentals of predestination. It seemed Calvin used Philippians 1.6, which reads, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Combined with the theology of God's sovereignty from creation to the present to establish the ideology of predestination. If this were true, some of us would have no chance of salvation. It would appear contrary, it appears contrary to God's giving his only begotten son for everybody. This is the difference between foreordination and predestination. With foreordination, God has called us to do a certain thing, but gave us the will to fulfill that call or reject it. Pre predestination would only mean we were created like robots without a will of our own. As a parent, wouldn't you love your children to love and devote their lives to you of their own heart, from their own heart, rather than you forcing them to love you? That's a common sense question, but we also have to remember that common sense ain't all that common. The first section of our scripture positions Paul as a reminder that we should not let sin reign in our mortal bodies so that we obey its evil desires. That we should not offer any part of ourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of ourselves to him as an instrument of righteousness, for sin shall no longer be our master, because we are under the we are not under the law, but under grace. By the mercies of God, we are no longer subject to the impossibility of living by the Mosaic law, but by the law of grace by Christ Jesus, for the first law is a killer. But the latter, the first law is a, a, a killer and a schoolmaster, but the latter is a life giver. 
See 1 Peter 5.10 and Galatians 3.24. Therefore, we have become slaves to righteousness, according to Romans 6.15-23, through 23, but only if we submit to the law of grace. It's a covenant or contract, if you will, in which God offers all the benefits of salvation to sinners who, by God's gracious ordination, receive them in faith in Christ and a binding agreement between God and Christ and between God and his people. If my people, which are called by my name, so humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.14 in closing, I want to ask a few thought-provoking questions and make a statement to leave you with, to leave with you. How can we prove Paul's teaching to be true? Well, have you ever had a horrible habit that you could not get rid of on your own, but it was washed away after you received Jesus Christ? as your personal savior. Have you ever been in such deep trouble that only a miracle from above could get you out of it and suddenly it was washed away? If so, then you have proven there's new life in Jesus, at least to yourself if not to anyone else. Just never forget the song that Reverend Timothy Wright, by Reverend Timothy Wright, trouble don't last always, and especially if you're in Christ Jesus. So Paul pleads with us to fight on till death because even a believer full of faith can fall and lose the battle. This is why Paul says in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have gained the reward, King James Version says, apprehended. For he realized the frailty of the human spirit that can self-destruct within the last minutes of life and lose all what we have fought for in Christ Jesus. But the prize is far greater than life in this world, and it would be a shame, an awful shame, to lose it in the final hour. If we have a sinful thing in us that we can't get rid of ourselves, we should acknowledge that sin we have an issue with because to ignore it or to, de or to deny it will make it a force we cannot overcome. Do not hide it. Acknowledge it and give it to Jesus for the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. We have to distract ourselves from the predilections to sin and fight until the death because Christ Jesus could have given in and given up before he suffered the punishment we deserve. But if he had, where would we be today other than lost in darkness and eternal death? It's a more than valuable sacrifice he made for us. More precious than anything in this world that this world can offer. We should also not let our past overshadow our future. But keep fighting our past until we get to the point where the Father sees us to be the exact image of his Son. Thank God Jesus didn't give up, nor did he give in. If you agree, say amen. See you next time.